Welcome everyone to episode 186 of the Board Game Barbecue podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm super excited tonight for a special reason that I'm going to talk about in a second. But first I'll say, hey, Adrian, how you doing? That sounds like I'm <laughs> second best or last. <laughs> It sound like oh crap. <laughs> I'm really excited about first something. We'll get... I have to get this moron out of the way. <laughs> Let me get him out of the way. Out. Hurry up. Uh, oh, that's so mean, but it's okay. Well, it's so it is true, a little bit but like that, fine. but it's not really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is off to a bad start. Um, <laughs> what, I'm good. What I was going to say was that we have a um, uh, someone who you all know. Uh, someone who left us for a little while and uh, we're really excited and happy to have him back as part of our crew. It's Def. Welcome back, Def. Hello. I was trying to stay quiet and not spoil it all this time. <laughs> I had to mute my microphone for a minute there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this it's, is cool. We've got the dream team, the three of us. Great. It's great to be back and uh, I've missed talking to you guys. So very, very happy to be back. We missed you heaps too, but it sounds like you've um, you've got a lot of material for us. You've been playing a lot of games apparently, so looking forward to hearing about that. Um, and I know, Adrian, you've been playing a lot of board games this weekend as well. Yeah, I, I've been playing loads because we had the four days to holiday. Yeah. We just basically did some yard work and then just binge played games. Like That's really cool. And it was really nice because there's not often times where we get to sit down and play like a whole day do you know what i mean like a whole yeah. 7 a.m till 7 p.m kind of a day but we've done that a couple of times and that's been lovely it's been I really fun about, i don't know about you guys but it's just sort of becoming like one of my favorite times of the year because unlike the other kind of holidays like christmas is kind of crazy right it's really busy and it's like it's Huge lead up, huge lead up, up, getting all the toys, everything. Easter is like comparatively so chilled out. Mm. Yeah, there's no shopping, there's no running to, you know, the malls or anything like that. It's Mm. just, yeah, so 12 podcasts. Yeah, (laughs) whose idea was that? What a fool who did that. No wonder you're not the favorite. I mean, they can see that. Yeah. yeah, but um, no, it's been really cool. I I did the egg hunt thing with the kids today, and um, oh, that's nice. And I sat and played a board game with Sultan, and yeah, yesterday I played a few games with with my friend Kerry. Hello, Kerry, if you're listening. Sailor mouth, um, Kerry, my mate. Yeah, <laughs> everyone's <laughs> mate, Kerry. Exactly. Yeah. So that was really fun. Um, she showed me a game called Fantasy Realms. Oh, nice. Which yeah, it, it won the – I think it won Kenneth, Kenneth Spiel, right, last That's year. That's a light card, card, yeah. card game, isn't it? Yeah, yes. I've seen it. So, okay, so full disclosure, I did not like Star Realms. I really did not like that game. There was a, this, this, like, back and forth, like, I'm going to wound you for 28 and then you heal for 32. And, yeah. you know, like, like, back and forth like that. I didn't enjoy it. And I like deck building, so it was a bit disappointing for me. And when I heard of Fantasy Realms, I kind of thought it was going to be a deck builder. I thought it was going to be kind of along those veins, but like, but fantasy. It's not like that at all. And it's kind of hard to explain this game, but it does something really neat. So it has about, I think it has like seven or eight suits. It's got a lot of suits in it. It might even be more than that. Um, and a wild suit as well. And it has basically, uh, it'll have like a points, uh, how many points you're going to get if you have that that card in your hand at the end of the game um so it's going to be the end of the game you're going to do like a big reveal you're going to have seven cards in your hand that you're going to score and on the text it's going to have like a penalty so more often than a bonus so like you think of all these card games as all this like abilities oh i'm going to do this and that and well there is a bit of that like some of the cards say hey this is going to score you an extra 80 points if you have a wizard in your hand or whatever as well but there's all these penalties they're like oh this card uh if you have this you completely blank your armies so that whole suit is blanked it doesn't do anything so then you kind of like reading all these cards so you might have like a few cards in your hand that blank each other and then stop each other from doing (laughs) something and then you might have one that blanks a bad penalty that you didn't want so you're like i wanted to blank that (laughs) i'm I'm not swearing these these blanks aren't swearing blanks or swear words in my head already (laughs) Like yeah, him. it is like that. <laughs> I'm gonna blank this guy and this. Yeah, it's um, 
it sounds funny, but it's uh. and it's super confusing when you're trying to like put together what cards are actually going to score and what aren't. So you have to keep reading them, but it's kind of interesting. It does like a, a different thing I wasn't expecting. And it's kind of, uh, it's really simple to play. It's like you pick up two cards and you discard one. So it's like this, you know, pick and mm. play kind of thing. Super easy. Mm. Um, but it does all these kind of interesting like combos that are sometimes good and sometimes bad and you want to get rid of stuff. And I really liked it. <laughs> I was really surprised. I was just not expecting to like this game at all. And I really did like it. I was like, this is a really cool little warm up game. Yeah, that's cool. As uh, as Kerry had it along and she played it loads, did she whip no, you? She just, no, she just got it. She, oh, I think okay. she just bought it. She played it. Uh, she tried it at the game day, at the Sydney game day. Um, I mm. saw them playing it there and I was like, oh, that looks okay. And then um, I could see it wasn't what I was expecting because I the, I saw the big reveal at the end. That's what I saw at the game day. I saw them all laying out their cards and like, oh, well, I've got this and this gets scores me, you know, heaps. I've got the princess and that scores me heaps because I've got the unicorn. <laughs> it sounds yeah. really, it sounds really funny. Yeah, the princess is riding on the unicorn and that gives it extra points. And, you know, it is kind of simple like that, but it's cool. It's also got, like, I think I had, I had like the fire or the, the great fire um, and because I had smoke, that went really well with the fire. So I got like heaps of extra points. And then I had, um, I think it, it, the fire blanked so many cards. It blanked like almost everything except uh, I got this other special thing that worked with the fire. I just kept getting all these like combos that worked really well with fire. So I think you've, you've just got to try and get, you know, a niche and, and go into that and try and get lots of points there. Mm. I can imagine maybe it would be frustrating if you couldn't do that, like if you couldn't find the cards that you were really looking for. Yeah. But that's why you've got – so you – because people are discarding openly, someone might mm. discard something and it's like, oh, that's – I needed that. And so you pick mm. that up How instead. How big is the deck? It's a pretty big – it's pretty big. I think it's – maybe it's 80 cards, yeah, 100 okay. cards mm. or something. Yeah. No doubt they're going to add to it for sure. Mm. Yeah. It's easy to do. But um, yeah, really good. You should check it out as if for like a little fillery thing. It's really cool. Yeah, nice. Talking about fantasy stuff, mm. the biggest I'd say fantasy video game of this year so far. People have already dubbed game of the year, Elden Ring. Okay, mm. Mm. haven't played it myself, but I've watched many tutorials and people playing it because I just don't have the hours to soak into something like that. Yeah. My question is. If a board game designer and publisher was to make Elden Ring the board yeah. game, who would you want to make it? Oh, I already have it in my head. It's real simple. The Adam people Kupinski. that made Kingdom Death Monster? No, I'd go with Adam <laughs> oh. Kapinski and uh, Glass Cannon because they already have converted a video game to – a uh, board game and I, even though I haven't got frost punk yet, I love the oh, look yeah. of it. I love the feel of it. I love what they've done and they've really, they've got that in and I don't want chip theory to do it cause they're already doing the uh, elder scrolls. So yeah. this is a competing, you know, market. So I would like to know if you guys would have an opinion on that. Yeah. Cause I it's would... going to happen. Come on. It's, it's definitely it's gonna, Yeah. Someone's going to pick that up. Yeah. Yeah. I have an objection there. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, shush death. You just came back. You already have objections. That's <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I, I think those, those designers would make a fantastic game. A, a, a sort of nemesis type or, you know, this war of mind type game. But if, if we're looking for something that has an open world, exploration element to it my mind and this could be like you know miles off but my mind went straight to cody miller the person that designed zaya legends of a drift system mm. okay um so i don't know they um recently did a kickstarter um as well for something you know fantasy um it was um what was it called? Adiria? Yeah, I saw that. And, you know, that was the same type of thing, exploration and open world and stuff like that. 
Mm. Um, but yeah, those those guys that you mentioned, they don't definitely knock it knock it out of the park. I think, um, especially in something that is more sort of higher fantasy or you yeah. Know, and I, I I just think that it's it's definitely going to happen. I don't think I think in in a year's time that this will be somebody will pick up the idea. and someone will be picking it up. Yeah, because it's well, like George R. R. Martin. It's huge game. All these massive fantasy games are slowly getting converted into board games, and they have that market of like the people who play the games, the video well, games want to play the board game. So it'd be interesting to see how the chip theory games for um you know campaign Elder for, for Elder Scrolls will, yeah. will go this year because I I do think that it will probably be huge, um, yes, much bigger than you know their last too many bones campaign, which was their biggest one. <laughs> Mm. Um, they have that pedigree, hey. So they I do, think but that, I think people that don't play the board games and stuff that miss Elder Scrolls and has played Skyrim and all that, and that want the next thing before there would be a video game, I think that there'd be a massive market for that. Just like when you see, you know, um, Zombicide do a Marvel thing, everybody jumps on it, and they're not necessarily all board gamers. And Marvel United as well. A lot of people are like, I love Marvel. And I want to play something new, and they might be coming new, fresh into the hobby. I think there'll be a lot of hardcore Elder Scrolls fans, Morrowind fans, Skyrim fans that all go, "I'm backing this." But it does scare me the price point, like the <laughs> yeah. chip theory price point, might be, make people go, five hundred bucks for a board game." Now I'm okay. I'll just play the video game on but, Steam. You know, I mean, what's the story here? Do we think that video gamers are, you know? There's crossover, or, right? Yeah. yeah but how, how much crossover? <laughs> they're retiring, because like me. So, some of them, <laughs> they're retiring. Some of them have, have it, like, the last video game I played was Diablo 3, so it's been a while. But <laughs> So you're retired, right? Yeah, I'm retired <laughs> as well. I'm retiring. So, so is, when is when video games get too much for us, we <laughs> just too Some of these games game. <laughs> that did not exist, like, um, what was the um, this Space 4X one that was a campaign last year? It was massive even though it was clear that the game was years away. And it was massive because all the video gamers swarmed on the campaign. I was like, yeah. surely not all of these people play board games. What was the uh, campaign called? It wasn't ISS remember. Vanguard. No, it's um, no. Stellaris. Oh, yeah. Stellaris. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I never played that, actually. I haven't played the video game of that. Oh, me neither. But they, they often bring in a big audience these oh yeah yes. that's that's why i think someone will pick up elder elden ring and it will get made into a video uh, into well, a board game. okay so my money is going on eric m lang because he did bloodborne mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. did dark souls as well so he's already got like you know those two under his belt and i haven't played any of them which is kind of a shame but i guess so i like the dark souls games and i like bloodborne and i guess the thing is with them is the combat is really hard. It's really difficult and it's not just mashing buttons and you got to be really precise and timing oh. is, is important. And I think that's really hard to convey in a board game. I really think that's Agreed. super. So that, yeah. so my favorite thing in those video games is not something I'm going to find at the table, but apparently the Bloodborne game does do all right with the combat. Like the combat's apparently kind of cool, the mechanism mm. in that. Um, so yeah. maybe, maybe he will do this, the next one. Yeah. I don't know if you saw, um, there's a new game that Cold World is um, creating called Arcs, which is like a space opera type yeah. game. I was reading his um, board game diaries that he posts on Board Game Geek, and he said something that applies in this situation. He said that a video game creates engagement and excitement for the players through... Um, an always sort of evolving situation where a board game cannot do that. It, it it creates what we call the board game loop, where it kind of gets you gets the players back into doing the same thing because otherwise you'll be, you know, getting out of the immersion and checking rules all the time if something new always happens. Yeah. Mm. The video games do not have that problem. And so th that was very, very clever the way he put it. I urge yeah. you to go read it, but um, this, you know, I this think applies. I sort of said that, like, on the show as well. Hmm. You already yeah. came on the show, you sort of mentioned that because the whole thing with Oath was, like, adding just small, like, really small new things to it, mm. right? 
just a f- couple of cars, just a little bit. It's, mm. I guess it's the it's that whole legacy thing, and that sometimes works really well. But uh, yeah. sometimes you are finding, like we talked about before, Adrian, when we you know we did the Patreon exclusive, like the pandemic spoiler. Yeah, that it can get a bit much. Like you can forget things because yeah, you've got Constantly. new rules to to add in all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the thing. That's why I think Frostpunk will work quite well because it's always got that core mechanisms behind it. You're trying to feed the furnace. You're trying to do certain things to keep your civilization rolling, but the actual scenarios and the little twists in the story surrounding that change, as opposed to, you know, we're going to go from here to another location and then all of the mechanics change. Whereas I think that's why... I think Frostpunk should work pretty well because it doesn't just have the one scenario that you're doing constantly. You don't just play it once and you're done. There are a few different scenarios to play within that game, but it's they're just slightly different. They're different enough to add enough for you to play it and want to come back, but they also add a point of difference so that you're not playing the same exact thing time after time. So I'm very excited to play Frostpunk when it arrives at, at your house. Woo-hoo. <laughs> yeah, that'll be Invite awesome. Invite yourself I can't wait. Oh, he's we're totally doing it. I can't wait. I don't care if it rises at midnight. We're it's getting done. <laughs> definitely going to get done. So, I um I think that yeah, it's really tough. I think that board games really, you know, they should. Well, they shouldn't just stick with what they're good at. That sounds, you know, that's not what I want to say. But but board games can do things that that video games can't. And mm. like I'm thinking of like Anno, for example. Anno with its like crazy cubes, you know, in a in a video game, moving these cubes around would just, you know, be silly. Like it would feel silly. But here you've got Anno eighteen hundred, which is far far less complicated than the video game, but still has this really unique mechanism to it, mm. which is super fun. Like it's really fun putting those little workers on the on the. You guys have played it, right? I haven't played it yet, but I have. Oh, I own it. It's on my shelf of shame. Oh, you own it? Okay, oh. okay. I, I yeah, don't so- even have it. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't say that that Anno eighteen hundred, the board game, does what uh, the video game does. You just can't say that at all. It's like a totally different thing, but oh. it's so neat. It, it's it's a really neat board game. It stands on its own. It doesn't need to feel. It doesn't need to give you that same experience. Mm. Yeah, I get what you mean. So, what else is? What else has been hitting the table? No, well, I've been playing a bunch of other games, but I just read a piece of news just the other day that really interested me that I wanted to talk to you both about because this is a game okay. that I know that you both don't – I don't. I haven't heard any of you really talk about in any kind of depth, but Stone and Meyer are doing the Viticulture oh, yes. co-op expansion. I saw that. So there's okay. an expansion now for Viticulture that's going to be a co-op expansion. I haven't played Viticulture myself. I don't know if you guys have or not. I haven't yes, really heard you I talk have. about it much, but would you? Is that something that you guys would be interested in, like a co-op expansion for Viticulture? Does that? Yeah, I don't know if what the market is for that because I think Viticulture, from what I've heard, is amazing at what it is. So to flip it and make it co-op, I don't know if that's. I don't know. I just don't know if that's. I don't know if that's something that Pete the masses want. That's what I'm getting at. I don't know. I mean, it's got a really large fan base for yeah. sure. There's a lot of people that love that game. Well, it's still right? getting bought now, right? It's still getting printed. It's still sure. getting sold. So. Yeah, it's a very popular game. I think yeah. I, moved, I moved away from Viticulture. I um, Initially, I really liked what it did in terms of uh, just having that really tight worker placement where, you know, you don't have – you had hardly any workers. I think you start with three. Three and an and a grande, two and a grande, grande, yeah, maybe. Is it two and a grande? Yeah, something oh, like yeah, that. Yeah, I can't remember, but and yeah, then you've got the few. whole year. You got the whole year to to plan things, and of course, uh, you're always going to do way too much in summer and have no one left over for winter, and that's when mm. you want to train someone yeah. for the next year. <laughs> that's when you get more workers. So, so I really liked what it did in the beginning, um, but it, I had that that complaint that you know I'm sure that a lot of people have heard before that the cards that you pick up are kind of swingy and random. I've heard that a lot. Yeah. So so I ended up moving it on. But I don't – but in terms of maybe that would make it a good co-op because yeah. then you're not – you know, in a competition, that sort of swinginess 
is not great. But if yeah. you're co-op, then maybe that's not so bad. It'll be super interesting to see because it's obviously got the other expansions that are in it. Then they're going to add a co-op one. I'd like to see how that all then how that converts from being a complete a game that's been made for what like ten years ago, or whatever. Ten yeah. years, right? Twenty twelve. Twenty yes. years. Twenty twelve. Yes. Yeah. Ten years old. Still has a massive following. Still sells copies. Then expansions added. Then to change it into a co-op game. I just want to. I'd like to see what the people that like viticulture think about that when it happens. That's what interests me. I think, yeah, I think Sarah said it's a, it's a very loved game. Like, I think it's probably one of these games that's becoming a bit of a standard thing in somebody's collection. Um, mm. Yeah. And I have no doubt that this expansion will sell really, really well, even if it's, it's just for people to see what, what, it what does. it's like, you know, and yeah. what it does. Because if you live, if you love a game a lot, then it's it's a no brainer. Even if you're not sure about an expansion, you might go, well, even if it's just for a few games, I I would like to try that. But how the game would work in cooperative mode, I'm, yeah, I don't really know. No, it will be interesting. That's for sure. I wonder what, yeah, who's the who's the bad guy that you're competing against? You know, like there's always something you can, you're sorry, yeah. there's always something you're like cooperating for seven to pl- try and Seven beat, plagues right? of the pharaoh coming down to the grapes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The cask, the, the uh, cask wine industry is here playing against the cheap, the cheap up against goon, the goon bag, <laughs> the goon bag industry. Um, I lost all my BG stats. No. Yes, no. and I'm very upset that, that, about it. That would drive me mad. I, <laughs> you would be what? so upset. All that time. <laughs> you would you drive you're not going to get that time back. It would drive Def so crazy because he loves his stats way more I than I do. I like, I like them a bit, and I definitely enjoy them. I have looked through them, but Def loves his stats. Imagine if you lost them all, Def. Imagine it. It doesn't. It's not going to happen because I, I actually do a manual backup every every few weeks and save some kind of file somewhere just in case something goes wrong. Yeah. Um, and um, well, as it's was, worth it. Trust me. Well, how did it happen, day, Adrian? How did it happen? I, so I dropped my phone and it's like not working anymore. Oh. So I then got a new phone, which then took all the apps across. And then when I clicked the, when I logged in on BG stats to get all my stuff, mm. like it just came up with like, four plays of barrage from like oh, 2020 no. or something and then a couple of other things and didn't i was like it, where's all my stuff didn't it sync it to your board game geek profile though yeah but i have like four of those and i'm not very good at keeping all of the information now i have uh, one new one that i'm one, just one. keeping <laughs> i've deleted the old ones i've paid the like dollar 50 or whatever it is for a year's worth to like automatically sync it or, or do something. I yeah. don't know what that thing was. I don't know. And now hopefully I can start a whole new fresh lots of stats and, uh, mm-hmm. and keep them. But man, yeah, I have to say, like I was actually a bit upset about it because I wasn't that bothered at first. I was like, no, oh, you know what? I'm just not going to keep stats anymore. I'm just going to go with Connor's style. Who cares? And then when I finish games, MJ's putting her stats in, and I'm like, man, I really want to remember all these stats. <laughs> <laughs> now I was really upset about it. So I ended up, yeah, fixing it all and starting afresh. So unfortunately, yeah, I lost wow. all the information. Yeah, it sucks. That does suck. At least MJ's got some of like, or like three quarters of your games. In yeah, there. probably ninety I mean, percent to be honest. But. I was just looking at my stats just before we started, um, just to see. You know, we're talking about sizzling a game. I was like, "What games have I played since the last episode I was on?" And I have played seventy-two different games over two hundred and forty-four times, and. Um, almost 300 hours since I was last on the podcast. So mm-hmm. I, I love my stats. I, I love looking at how much time I spend with the games and how much time yeah. I spend with different people I play. You inspired me to start keeping the times, and I have really enjoyed that aspect of it. Like as in, we set the game up, everything's ready to go. Just before we take our first turn, I hit the play button and it starts the timer and yeah. starts to count. I really enjoy that now. Like I like looking at that because I can look at a game and go, the first game we played at this took us not what an hour and 45 minutes. But mm. The second game, 
only took an hour and 15 because yeah. obviously we were learning, checking the rule book and stuff. So we drop half an hour. And I find that more interesting than anything, just to think that when we first start to play it, we don't know what the hell we're doing. It's like checking the rule book constantly. Don't really know, oh, this will do. And then, then when you learn the game, how fast it becomes is quite scary. And that's actually kind of really what happened today. We played a, a Praga Kaput Regni. Oh, yeah. And I got it for Christmas. And even though a certain person isn't absolutely enamored with it in this room, as you chuckle. I'm not in the chuckles. room. But... <laughs> um, you're not in the room. You're in the virtual room. Technically not in the room. But I, I actually really enjoyed it, and it was really cool because the first time we played it, man, there's a lot of stuff going on, like lots of little things happen in the game. There's lots of little bits and lots of little things to try and track and follow, and all the iconography is actually pretty decent, if I'm honest. It's not bad by any means, but I think the first game took us just over two hours. Then the game that we played today, which we haven't played it for like a couple of months took an hour and 40 for the second game. Then the last game took like just over like an hour and 20. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I'd be interested to see what you think about it, Def, because I know you're a huge Underwater Cities fan. And even though it's not anything like Underwater Cities, it is done by the same designer. Uh, is it Vladimir Suchi? Is that his name? Yeah, Vladimir it is. Um, unfortunately, I haven't played any of his two games he designed after Underwater mm. Cities. Uh, but yeah. I'm very, very keen to try it. It looks, yeah. it looks a bit, if I dare say, too beige for my tastes. But I, 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 I'd have to play it. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, I actually really like the board itself. The board reminds me of like a kind of Where's Wally type thing, even though it's not as small details. It's just kind of a bit. I don't know. It's pretty busy. <sighs> Yeah, like a um, like a was jig. Do you know what a was jig is? Yeah, it's like a jigsaw, but you're doing it from the point of the view of the person looking at the scene. So, the the, the jigsaw itself is a picture of people looking at something, and you make a jigsaw of what they are all looking at. Some kind of shocking thing that's happening. It kind what? of reminds me of one of those. I didn't think that that was a- no. I mean, that's what a was jig, isn't it? You know what I thought a was jig. <laughs> you know what I thought a was jig was. Is it a the, dance? <laughs> the like, yeah, ha- it's like a it has like sand or something in it, but then it's got all these little weird things in it in the sand in the tube with sand and all these little pieces of stuff, and you've got to find whatever you can find. Like you've got to find all the different things. Ah, what's that? What is that called? That's know, does, a thing. It, does it look like a Praga Kaput Regni? <laughs> well, kind of, because it's got well, a lot of beige, go. but then it's got all these other little weird things going on. Hey, yeah, well, that makes perfect anyway. sense. Whatever that thing <laughs> Either is. way, it makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, I really, the thing that I really enjoyed about Praga Kaput Regni is the action selection. So you have this rondelle mechanism where you kind of have like, it's almost like a cog with missing teeth from the cog and you insert the actions into the cog. And as you take those actions, the cog turns. So the ones that are further at the front, uh, you have to pay less gold to take those actions. And eventually if they keep turning and keep turning, they become victory points. So you might take an action that's worth five victory points and an action, even though you might not want to take that action necessarily when it's worth five victory points, it's almost worth just taking it for the hell of it. It's like, man, the action that I'm going to get is, is a medium. It's not as good as the other one, but I'm not going to have to pay for it because of where the wheels positioned. I found that really interesting. And I actually really enjoyed that part of the game more than anything is looking at that wheel and trying to decide, right, what do I want to take and what I want to do? Essentially you're trying to rebuild the city of Prague and there's lots of different elements to the game. There's actually a cathedral where you're actually trying to set your sort of worker and place him on the different spots of the cathedral. And it's almost like a tech track, but the tech track is like a five by five grid. And it, as the more you, the higher up the cathedral you go in one of the rows, or in one of the rows, you get more points, but then you have to also slide him to the right in the columns to also times those points so you end up the further to the right you get you get more victory points but the further back you go is how much it multiplies by and there's also another one called the hunger wall and as you build the city walls 
there's also an element that you actually do the same thing but on a completely separate board. You also build, build the Charles Bridge, so you actually walk across like the uh, the King's Road, and as you go along the King's Road, you get to do these different things, and as you do those, you eventually get to place pieces of the bridge on the bridge itself, which give you like a one-time benefit or even in-game victory points uh, conditions, basically. But there's also like there's these things that are really interesting as well. There's these plaza tiles that go throughout the city, uh, which are in the bottom half of the board, and they just get placed out around at the start. And as you build different buildings in the city, you actually kind of get dominance around some plazas, and then that also gives you different amounts of victory points and different bonuses. Area so, control type. Yeah, area like a dominance thing, like an area control -y type thing. But in a two-player game, there's not much, like any yeah, area yeah, control yeah. there's not much battling for it. But in a four-player game, I bet that would get a bit crazy and can get a bit hectic. So I'd like to see that. I'd like to try and play it with four to see, to see what happens for sure. But it's also like, the two parts of the city, the city's actually split by the King's Road. You have the south yeah. side, which is like the poorer side of town, yeah. and it's not as an expen it's not as expensive to build there. But the old city, which is the old part of the city which got restored, is a kind of more affluent part of town, therefore it's more expensive to build there. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. And I mean me and Connor have spoken about this before, but the game starts off and you have these eggs like in it, and you use the eggs on the bridge like and it's like what is that all about like why is there eggs that doesn't make any sense but apparently they use the eggs egg whites i believe to mix up in the mortar to strengthen the bridge when they were building the bridge and the bridge still stands today so it must do something like it, it must, must be, be strong decent eggs. strong eggs right but yeah, there were some other funny things there's like a funny fact in the back of the book that apparently they asked a farm for eggs and for some reason they boiled all the eggs and brought them there hard boiled and that obviously were no use yeah, that didn't to, that didn't work yeah that didn't work yeah but it's it's they kind of fed it's just, everyone though fed, fed the workers yeah well that's that's kind of part of it there is like a hunger wall track where you're trying to mm. feed feed the city but it's it's an interesting game. It's very point salad -y, like you're getting points from everywhere. And you do get points as you go through the game. You get the majority yeah. of your probably half your points, probably fifty percent. But at the end of the game, you kinda your points are coming from lots of different avenues. And that's kind of quite interesting because the first game, man, it was like it was con one of those games where you're hopscotching over each other. So it's like I got 20, MJ got 22, then I got 26, then she got 31. And we were just constantly jumping each other uh, right until the very last last turn. And I think I won by like six points. But I, I really like those games where you're playing a Euro game and you're not just like 60 points behind and you just see that you're not going to catch up because there's nothing worse than being like halfway through a game and thinking I'm not going to catch up. This is it. Like, I can't do anything. Whereas this doesn't really have that. So far, we've always been quite close. And even when she was, she did a, a tactic where she actually got really far ahead early and I was behind, but I could see myself constantly catching her up and chasing her tail from those actions that she did. She won, but only just. But even that was really interesting. So, yeah. Is there enough variability to sort of keep you coming back to it you reckon over time because you know is there enough in terms of you know just to make the game a bit more interesting and still have yeah. things to discover after a few games yeah definitely because you, you basically you have your own little kind of building or city kind of that sits in front of you which is like an action selection space um and you can upgrade those actions. And in the first era, they're all level one actions. And those actions okay. you can upgrade to do different things. It might be every time I mine gold, I get a stone. Or every time I visit the quarry, I get a victory point. And, and they, you can actually build that up in your own little town. Then you also have the walls that surround that. So you can also surround your little bay, your little uh, kind of homestead in these walls, and they also do multiple different things. They give you windows, they give you eggs. Windows can be used to do extra bonus actions or even move you on the hunger track or the cathedral. Like there's a whole bunch of different things 
and those tiles are all randomized as well. So in the first era, you start with, I think you get like 12 of each and you only put out four on the table of each type. So you've got tech, you've got the buildings that go in the city and then the city walls. And then once you eventually move that rondelle around enough, a little cube drops into a little hole and that brings you into the second age or second era. And then basically once that happens, you remove all those tiles and you replace it with era two tiles. And then they are much more advanced versions of the same thing. They are more expensive, but by then you've got enough of an engine going. But then you also have the action wheel. So the actual rondelle itself on the inner circle of the rondelle, there's like a window or an egg or there's gold or there's quarry. And there's also special building actions, all this stuff on the inner side, on the outer side of the cog itself, that's where the actions go. So you can actually draw the actions. And when you take your action, it might be, oh, I get a gold this time. Or you might take the action at me, oh, I pay a gold and I get an egg. But all those action tiles, there is a sort of um, a basic version, but there's also an advanced version. I love the advanced version because you flip all those tiles over and nothing matches. So all of the actions are randomized on those advanced action spaces. And that gives it like a really crunchy feel because there's times where you're like, man, I really want to take that tile for that extra gold and this action. But like I said, the rondelle might have moved around enough that a inferior action is worth five victory points. And that's quite mm. a lot in this game. So I, I think there is enough variability. And for sure. a game where MJ was like, I hate this game. I'm never playing this again. Mm. This sucks. It's so boring and bland. Is that what she it. said? Is this yeah. It? Really? It's the truth. Yeah. And I was like, please play it with me, please. I'll be good. And, uh, <laughs> we played it twice in a row and she actually really enjoyed it. She was like, man, actually, I enjoy this game a lot more this time around. And okay. I think it's like any game. Like when you play it the first couple of times and you're learning and there's lots of iconography and you're constantly checking the rule book, it kind of does absorb some of the fun out of it. Well, this time we just played it we checked the rule book a couple of times for a few of the, uh, the technologies and that, and that was really it. So cool. Yeah. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I really like it. So I really rate it as a medium to sort of not even just a medium weight, not medium to heavy. I find it's just like a medium weight mm. Euro game that has lots of different variability and yeah, cool tracks and tech and different things. So. I did like the upgrades that you can do. Like, mm. I thought that was pretty cool. The you get a better action when you do a certain thing, right? Yeah, that's right. Is that how it works? Yeah, I remember yeah. that. That was pretty cool. And you also you get the technology. So, like level once you start to on your player board, you have different things because you have a, a university track, and I can't remember the name of the other one. I'll have to check it, but you basically have these two little tracks on your board. And as you go up the university track, you eventually like, un I think it might be a library in a university. You unlock these books and they give you a different technology, which gives you an asymmetrical power for your own player board. And then that leads on to like really cool combos and abilities. Cause you might end up with like a level four and the level four might be something crazy, like take a free action and get a bunch of resources or, or do something that you just basically couldn't do any other way. And yeah, that, that makes it quite fun trying to get some of those. So yeah. I really enjoyed Messina. Maybe you should play that. Next yeah. Season. I think that I really like that a lot. Yeah. I, I like the theme, which is I, kind of morbid, but I love it. Yeah. I like the theme too. I think that Suchi does like some cool stuff with the, his, with the player boards. Yeah. You know, like I think Praga did have a cool player board. I think underwater cities obviously does, you know, especially you can have like totally unique boards in underwater cities as well. Mm. Right. Which is really cool. Mm. And then, and the player board in Messina is so great. Maybe, like, if you play it, we should talk about it on the show. Yeah, I, I, it's not out here, right? Still, like, it's still. How did Mitch get it? He got it uh, sneakily, like through a S and deal, like oh. an S and deal gone wrong. <laughs> it sounds like an S and deal <laughs> gone right, but yeah, yeah. So that's it. I've just been playing that today, this morning, and really enjoyed it. So nice. Hmm. What so about yourself, we... Jeff? Well, I mean, um, uh, have you seventy-two games? What's your favourite? Oh, look, I've I've played heaps of great games, um, and some of them even in new configurations, as in you know different player counts, and with some of them for the first time. But 
I've been posting a bit in the community about this, and um, if you're frequenting the Discord, then you would have seen it, that I've gone down this new rabbit hole that reminds me so much of the um, the first rabbit hole I went down when I started getting more into board games, which was the, the Vital Lacerda games. And this one um, has been a similar journey where I, I got the first game of a series and you know, completely sort of fell in love with the system and um, the series and I started, you know, buying and playing more of them. That's the um, the coin series from GMT Games. Um, I now so- know a little bit about these because when you first said I'm playing coin games, I literally was like, where are the coins? I you don't thought understand. you roll a coin down. I was like, I was like, well, I thought there'd be lots of coins <laughs> and there's no coins. So... What's it all about? Yeah, COIN stands for, it's actually an abbreviation, it stands for Counterinsurgency. Um, and it's a series of games. The first one was designed by Volker Runke, who is a, um, a CIA security analyst. And uh, these games have a historic background. Um, they are all set in various you know, popular or or infamous sort of periods of history around the world in different times. And they all have the same focus though. They all they all try to look at some political and military conflicts between insurgent powers. So powers that were trying to come together and organize themselves and fill in gaps in in various situations caused by you know civil wars or political instability and whatever and the counterinsurgency power which is always some kind of you know bureaucratic um government that is established and has you know the the more power the more control over over the game over the situation and the first one I played was actually the last one that was published. There's been 10 of these games published so far, and there's um, a lot more coming down the line. But um, Volume 10 was a game called All Bridges Burning. And this has an actually very funny story because a few months ago, I had this completely random uh, sort of, you know, jumping into our Discord channel and. Uh, turning my camera on and just started talking about this game, which I had just played then, right? And a few people jumped on and they they later told me that was pretty awesome because I completely lost my mind with that because I opened the box and there was like, you know, a 40-page rule book and another 50-page playbook and seven player aids that are like four A4 pages filled with text and two other aids that have like the sequence, the game sequence, and another one that has the combat and another one that has the... And it was just... I just couldn't believe how this is something that people play. And uh, a lot of people told me later that they found that um, (laughs) crazy, me talking to myself um, thing entertaining. So I played that game by myself and I remember thinking, yeah, this is interesting but that's it's like a very it's like a very different thing i i remember saying i don't think i would even classify this as a game it's more like a simulation of things rather than a game that you know abstractly tries to narrate a story and then i have to tell you i left it alone for a few months and then i played it a second time and the second time it was like it was like seeing the matrix. It was like this whole thing unlocked. And because I knew the system at that point, um, you could see how it all works. And I completely fell in love and bought um, eight out of the, <laughs> the rest of the nine games that are wow. out there. Even, even though um, most of them are impossible to find in Australia, I actually had to source some of them directly from the publisher, which was pretty mental given they're in the United States. But um, the games have a couple of very specific, you know, um, things that I've I've come to really, really um, love. Now, one is that they tell these these stories of these conflicts from a very historic perspective, and they try to be as as accurate as possible, albeit abstract when when they create the game mechanics. But 
this is why these rule books are so massive. Like, you know, they explain the action in three sentences and then here you go, here's half a page of text as to why this action is important and what happened with that faction when they took that action and what does it represent. And here's some historic photographs that, you know, come into play in that period. Um, and no doubt that drew you in as well. Like you would have read all of that, right? As it, well. it did because mm. even though this game, All Bridges Burning, is about a historic period and a, a place I have zero information on, I never even knew it existed this conflict, as opposed to some other ones um, in the same series that are very, very popular. Um, the first one wa was a game called Andean Abyss, which is about the you know, the, the jungle sort of insurgency in, in uh, the drug um, inflicted Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, second one was Cuba Libre with the Castro insurgency in Cuba and stuff like that. Well, this one is about the Finnish civil war in 1917 and 1918. I didn't even know there was a civil war in Finland um, yeah, after the First either. World War. So... Even so, and, and when you ask people about, you know, which game should I play first out of these, they always tell you, oh, which period are you most interested in? That's how you're going to get into them. And yet I got into them through a game I knew nothing about the period, and it's still extremely attractive. You learn a lot of things, but most importantly, it's fascinating to see how these translate into game mechanics. And going back to the board game side of things, if, you know, how many people love Root for its asymmetry and the different factions that do different things, well, this is this is a whole new level because these factions represent completely different things in the game to the point where they win in a different way. Mm. So, for instance, in All Bridges Burning, there's three factions, the Senate, the Whites, the, the Communists, the Reds, and the um um the democrats the um, is this the one you showed me death when i was at yours the other day is it the uh, same one you did show me one and it had white red blue and i think gray in it i showed you i uh, i think i did i think yeah, I you showed did we got it out after we played um so you remember what we played <laughs> We played something, but yeah, I remember it. And I remember you showing me the different ways you can win and the, the victory points track and stuff and how they all won. And I found that really interesting. Like even the historical stuff that you only just touched on had me interested to play it. Like I'd like to try one. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's pretty um, crazy how they even managed to translate this stuff into a game, because I'm telling you, obviously the game is abstracted, but the actions and the way the factions work is extremely close to the representation of, of reality. So, for instance, the Senate, which is like the the, the whites in, in Finland, they want to control the population. They, they want population control, traditional population control. So all they care about is creating as many units as they can and then going after and moving them into the big cities where the population is. They don't really care about the regional areas in Finland. And this is represented by the regional um, locations on the board having zero population. So the Senate doesn't really care about what happens to them. And the Reds, they don't care about controlling the population. They care about the population sentiment. Is there enough opposition against the Senate? So they care about a completely different aspect of the game. So the Senate can go and control as many cities as they want, but the Reds care about, you know, the, the population having opposition. And the third faction, the Moderates, is very interesting because it's a non-violent faction. The other two factions, at some point in the game, when there's enough forces on the map, the game enters a second phase and they go to war. So there's additional actions that you can take that represent military conflict. Well, the third faction, the moderates, they don't care about any of that. And in fact, they cannot be attacked or attack the other two factions at all. All they care about is passing as much political um, discussions and, and pushing their political agenda and stopping the 
polarization in, in the political system in the country. And just talking about this makes my head swim because the, the way they've managed to translate that into a game is absolutely fascinating. So it, we, we're talking about different starting conditions on the map. You know, a faction could have one unit and another one could have 20. Um, they have different units, different things. They have different winning conditions. Um, and some of these are quite, quite, um, they, they have a lot of combinations as well. So for instance, the Senate wants to control the population, but at the same time, the German influence in the country needs to be smaller than a specific number. So what that translates to is that the, the, the Finnish Senate, they, they wanted to be in control of the country, but with as less German influence as, or help as possible. Otherwise, they were not really in control of the country. And so, um, yeah, it's been quite fascinating getting into this. Um, I've played one more game from the series, which is Gandhi, the um, British decolonization of, of India, which was a completely different level. Um, and yeah, as I said, I'm very looking forward to jumping into the rest of them. They've been absolutely fascinating. Diff, like, it sounds amazing. It sounds like it would be an, a great experience to play All Bridges Burning with three players and everyone doing these different things. But how does it go? Because I'm assuming you're playing this solo, right? Yeah, or so not. all of these games, here's, here's where it gets quite interesting for me personally, right? Hmm. When I bought these games, I saw that they all have AI opponents for every faction. So yeah. for all of these games, you can play with how many players you want and you can have the AI um, opponents filling in the slots, right? And yeah. a lot of people play these solo. They're not easy games to find people to play with. That's right. Like GMT, I know that on the GMT site, every time they, like, they've got their, the game there and then it's got like solo compatibility level or whatever, right? That's right. I, I don't know whether that means it's like whether it's the complexity of running the AI or whether it... No, it's actually if you can play it solo, if it's recommended to be played solo. So if right. it has a, a bot opponent already designed as part of the game, then the solo compatibility would be high. If it doesn't and it's not meant to be played solo, then it would be really low. Mm -hmm. But I have to tell you, the first time I played this game was this way. It was solo against the AI opponents and I really, really had a hard time. And when the game opened up to me was when I actually played all the factions myself. So I played all factions against each other. There's no hidden information in the game. And it is something I never thought I would do. And I was reading a lot of you know articles online and a lot of people saying, yeah, we play these with all factions. Um, just one person playing on fire. So I was like, I'm never going to do that. That doesn't sound interesting. That sounds, you know, it, it doesn't Playing appeal to itself me. three times over. Yeah, yeah, and yet this is what I ended up doing to the point of I bought Gandhi, the second game I got in the series, that is meant to have the best solo mode in the entire series. Yeah. I've played it solo, and then I was like, right, okay, now I want to play just four hand has four factions and I, I kept playing it off game again and again, just playing all four factions by myself because the way these games tell the story that emerges from, from the gameplay, it, it seems to not matter to my brain that I'm playing all four factions because it's it a reenactment. Is... You're doing a reenactment. Yeah. And it's I guess. Yeah. So it's not so... really about the competition and the winning, it's the it's like telling that story. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, some of these games, I don't know how you even begin to try and balance these games. You know, it's the, the, the game board situation and their abilities and everything are so different in so many different levels. I don't even know how you, you know, how do you play test to balance these? So it, to me, it's more about the experience and um, I'm, Looking forward to try to play this with a few, few of you if I can uh, find any victim. I mean, any players, and um, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see how that goes. But they're in investment, right? Because yeah. you need to readjust your 
how, how we, we view board games. Um, but as the, the positive thing is, as soon as you know the system, the coin system, um, all the games work in the same way. So all you have to know is what are the winning conditions and what does each faction do, and you're you're off. So the second game I played, I learned in a much, much faster rate than, than the first one. Kind of uh, like the 18xx thing, right? Mm. Yeah, no, not to that extent. Well, in the 18xx games, I feel that there's very, very small amount of new things you have to learn from one right. jumping one game to another. These ones are a, a lot more than that, but still helps a lot if if you have one under your belt. Then I think after that you can you can play any of these. So it says on here that it lasts 180 minutes to 360 minutes. All bridges burning. How long did it you take you to take to play it three handed solo for your first time? Uh, my first time, I remember because I was surprised by how long it took. That was five and a half hours, probably. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> but that was that was me trying to learn the game using a, a Eurogamer's approach. Right, mm. I opened, and this is why I had that mental breakdown in our Discord <laughs> channel, shouting, <laughs> shouting at the rule books because I opened the rule book and I started reading the rules. And eventually, and everyone I, was like reading it, going, "Are we meant to be seeing this? Yeah. Is this?" Did you start? Did you talk in Greek? Because I know if you're talking in Greek, you're getting mad. I can tell. And I ended up learning that that is not how you learn these games. the The rule book is like a, it's like a dictionary. You only refer to it ten years later if you need something. It's <laughs> like that not you, you know not ten years, but yeah. that type of thing. So you, mm. the way these games are meant to be played is you set them up, and then you start. Um, they have this fantastic playbook where they actually give you very little information about you know what each piece does and what they represent on the board, and they they walk you through the first three four rounds of the game, telling you exactly what card this player draw and you know, what pieces they move and what action they take and why are they doing this? And this next player now is going to do this to, you know, counter that. And they walk you through the entire game and you learn the game much faster that way. But you do have to, yeah, as a Euro gamer, it was difficult for me, right? To go into this knowing that I don't know how this works. I don't feel comfortable playing. What do you mean? Um and the playbook telling me, no, it's fine, it's fine. We'll walk you through this. Don't don't worry. Um, yeah, it takes and you a were bit like, no, I want to download all of the rules. All and the then information play the game. in my brain. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sounds really cool. I'm I'm very keen to try one. What are some of the other yeah, things think, again? Um, Death is there a Western one? So, so the first one was Andean Abyss, which is uh, from the drug. Um, insurgency, the drug cartels in Colombia. The second one was Cuba Libre with Castro's insurgency in Cuba. The third one is a distant plane, which is for the um, war in Afghanistan, um, which is much more recent. And you know, we would recognize a lot of the events that come in the game. All of these games, their central sort of mechanic is a deck of event cards that comes out and get occupied or played by some of the players. There's one for the um, Vietnam War. Um, there's one for the American um, Revolution. Uh, there's one from earlier years with the Gaelic revolt against Caesar. I think it's called Falling Sky, if I remember correctly. Um, another one for the fall of Roman Britain. Um, so they, they have all sorts of different themes. And um, there's there's one coming up, which is um, the, their first fictional one that they do, which is set on Mars. So, oh, wow. wow. Yeah, it's called Red Dust Rebellion. So very keen <laughs> to see how that goes. Red Dust Rebellion, that's cute. Yeah. That will be interesting, like, without all the history stuff. Mm. Hmm. Maybe they'll put Arnie in it. But it's very because interesting. Of... Um, I saw a, yeah. um, <laughs> I saw an interview of um, the designer of Olkorunke recently, and he said that they use a lot of these games to teach new analysts in the CIA how insurgency works in a lot of these situations and how to recognize it in some conflicts and you know what, what the expected sort of sequence of events is because powers always try to sort of fill in the gaps. In mm, mm. It was very, what very interesting. to counter what 
politically and all this. Sounds yeah. super interesting. I'm really keen. Like, I was really scared to play an 18xx until I did it, and now I'm not scared anymore. So I'm sure this will be the same. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, after playing these games, I'm not scared to play anything anymore. These were like the last frontier, I yeah, think, to the, me. Yeah, the last frontier, yeah. That's what it sounds like, 100%. No, no, wait. The last frontier is the campaign for North Africa. That's the next no. step. That's like yeah, the end of the line. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not suggesting you go there. <laughs> I'm not suggesting anybody goes there. Yeah, so no much. one do that. <laughs> Um, well, I also played uh, a bit of Eon's End, and I haven't played Eon's End for ages. And that went uh, really well for a while, and then it went really badly. Uh -oh. <laughs> we ended up we ended up losing, and we got the Nemesis down to like eleven health. But it was so good; it was such a good battle. It was a expansion pack, so I think the little expansion packs that you get for the for the game they tend to be really challenging Nemesis. Um, in those boxes because Nemesis, Nemesis, what's the plural of Nemesis? Nemesis, aliens, Nemesis. <laughs> Nemesis. Oh, sorry, that's a different uh, game. Boss. Aliens, the boss. yeah. Fight the boss. The bosses. Bosses. Yeah. Bosses. yeah. The boss. So we fought this boss. It was like a fluoro pink giant floating octopus skull thing, and uh, called he Kevin. Had... Sorry. Called Kevin. <laughs> called Kev. Big Kev. We called him. <laughs> <laughs> Octo Kev. Big Kev. Yeah. So um, he had like a mat, a terra mat, it was called, terra mat. And it had like seven, um, seven tokens on it, labeled seven to one. And basically, his special power was that he, you would have to take one of these terra tiles or something mm -hmm. uh, whenever he unleashed. So, um, so basically, if you, haven't heard me if you've somehow not heard me talk about eons end before um bad guys have like this special deck of cards and it has like um unique powers unique cards for them in there and it also you've got to make up this deck when you before you start playing and you've also got like random cards in there as well so it's a mix of like random stuff you don't know what's going to happen and then certain very specific special powers that the that in this case big kev could do and no one else could do and uh so this unleashed power that that this guy had was you take a one of these tokens that's on the terra mat and you've got to put it on your board and it covers your special mage power so you can't do your your special and instead of doing your special when you charge up you you can get rid of everyone's terra tiles if they've had to take them and if you ever get down to if you ever have to take the last one off the mat that's it it's all over you just lose Okay. And these it, things are horrible because you have to resolve them when you take them too. And they could be like um, you have to discard three cards and then mm. that's not so bad. It's not as bad. And then the next one is you've got to suffer damage. Mm. Then it's choose. You're going to either um, lose, suffer four health off, off Gravehold, which is what you've got to defend, or discard four cards or, you know, and or, or lose three charges or something. They all have a different power and they're all bad. So – does Big Kev work with the base Aeon's End or is he just goes where he can go to outcasts or whatever and you can just play it with him? Any. Yes. Any. Yeah, you can, cool. no, you can use it with any. So so basically the way they've done it is they've the, the way they've released Aeon's End games is they've released them in waves. So they had the first, mm. the base box, and then they released two of these small box ones, right? And that's why I have. Expansions. I have those. Which, which you yeah. use with the main, the core box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which you can use yeah, okay. with the core. And that's what, and I think that that's why they tend to do those a little bit harder because you've played the core box. Now yeah, you know you what you're doing. Something. And now this is like increased difficulty, right? Mm. So, and I can't remember which wave this guy was in. Uh, big Kev. Wave <laughs> eight? No, I don't have wave eight yet. That's legacy. Have you got yours Wait, yet? No, he's got, he's got eight arms because he's an octopus. Oh, so wave eight. Yeah. Wave eight. <laughs> uh, Ooh. Yeah, okay. I see what you did there. No, um, I think I'm getting that soon, by the way. Return to Gravehold. I've got an email. Oh, we, I think we all. I think yeah. it's coming. Yeah. It's coming. It's an work, so, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so we we got him down to 11 health, so close. Mm. But I died, and then I was the first one to go. And then, you know, uh, I think in this. Uh, when when someone's exhausted, if if you if they, I then have to suffer damage again, 
it's Gravehold that suffers twice as much damage. Yeah, double damage yeah. to Gravehold. Yeah, it's horrible. It's not fun. I've been and, through that a lot. Yeah. Well, in this one, I think <laughs> I think with Big Kev, it doesn't do that. It's got a special rule. It's like instead of doing that, then the person, the the player that's still alive has to take two more tokens or something like ah, more, okay, two more yeah. terror tokens and resolve them. It's, it's even worse. It's like even worse Ooh. than that one. Yeah. So, um, so we died in a very big way in the end. But we got him down to 11 health. That's still, that still feels good. You know, getting him yeah. down to that. that it's part. close. It's, it's not close. like he was on yeah. seventy-two. And, and usually, and didn't by the end of these games, you've powered your deck enough where eleven health is probably what one round, one yeah. turn, or yeah. one maximum one two turns turn. away. Yeah. yeah, especially if you've got like three prep spells that you yeah. know yeah. will do eleven damage. But yeah. he just you pull a nemesis card first, and you're out. Yeah, We've only see. played um, Eons and Legacy with my oldest daughter, and we finished okay. that. Um, yeah. And we just got Eons and the base game, but we haven't started that yet. So okay. keen to see what comes after that. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, it's good fun. I remembered why I love it so much. And I've got Ooh. so much, you know, this is the thing I really nerd out with, you know. Like I've got, I've got it all basically. And I've got, it's Ooh. all in a big kit. I've just got so many cards. Like I, ca so I took this to Carrie's house. And it was ridiculous. Like my bag broke. It was so heavy because I've got wow. <laughs> I've got it all in this big box. There's so many cards in there. I don't know how many cards are in there. But um, but yeah, it's good fun. I love. I still love it. It's a great game just to go back and pick up and play a boss. And, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Just it doesn't take long. It's like no, forty five minutes to an hour, and it's just yeah. good fun. And yeah. That's no, a great game. And I, yeah. I think there'll be a massive resurgence for it when we all start getting that legacy of Gravehold and everyone's getting all their, you know, Yeah. What did Sydney call it? The gloop, and... the gloop, gloop monster or whatever. Yeah. Looking gloop, forward gloop to that monster. one. The one where you actually have to set fire to your own house as well. Or... Yeah. I can't remember what she said. Anyway, so, yeah, I'm exciting. excited for that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, we might have to move on, guys, to the bracket. Hey everyone, it's Sarah here. I want to talk a little bit about one of our sponsors who has sponsored the podcast from the very beginning and that is Advent Games. AdventGames.com.au is an Australian board game store. This is at the store where I get all of my games from so you know that I'm not just advertising it just because this is uh, very personal to me. And uh, Dean, who runs it, is very knowledgeable about games. He is a huge board gamer himself, and he often gives advice and things like that. And just awesome all-round customer service. So all around New South Wales, you can get flat rate shipping from adventgames.com.au for $10. If you're somewhere else in Australia, you can get flat rate shipping for $15, not that much more. And if you are super local, you can even you can even see Dean at Chatswood on Tuesday nights to pick up games from him, from his very paws. So that is adventgames.com.au. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Okay, so the bracket is sponsored by Game Toppers. And we have uh, we have a battle to resolve first, which is Marvel Champions versus Eclipse Second Dawn. All right, guys, what did you think of of this mashup? Well, obviously they're completely different, but that's nothing unusual for our bracket battles, right? <laughs> so it's, <fun. laughs> like, it's yeah. uh, I don't know. Like I've only played that little bit of Eclipse with you and Jules that time like probably three quarters of a game or two thirds of a game. Yeah. And I thoroughly it. enjoyed it. Like I really, really did enjoy it. We didn't do a lot of combat. Like I said on the podcast, I think Jules has been incredibly kind to me and he could have probably was crushed me that a wasn't... thousand times over. But I think he was like, oh, yeah. you just um, I'm sorry. build your farm in the corner. Uh, I'll leave you till the I'm end. I'm sure he was leading up something. Are end. we talking about oh, yeah. the same person? Yeah. I haven't been away yeah. that long, have I? Yeah. That's it. Like I was like, <laughs> I think he could destroy me whenever he wants. I'm so weak. He doesn't even want to bother his time. <laughs> but it's fine. But I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed the tech, and I can see the massive appeal for that game. Like, and I can see that they are very different to mm. like that and Ti, and there's a couple other forest games that are quite different. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I think it was great, and I like. 
Marvel champions, but I haven't really got us the table much. I'm kind of waiting for Finn to get old enough to maybe get a bit of enjoyment out of it through his eyes. Cause even though I like it, I just not enamored with it. Like everyone else that got it just went all in and deep dive into it. And they absolutely love it. I did not I did not at you all. I got like, it. I all... sold it straight away. I, I bounced yeah, so I... hard off it. I actually liked it. I just haven't got anyone to play it with, and I just don't do much solo. So I would like to yeah. just, you know, I give it another year or so and play it with him because I think that's the thing he would really enjoy. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's something that we could really enjoy together. So, yeah, I just want to – I'm not going to get rid of it. It will stay there forever. By the way, I'll be so far behind. Everyone else will be on, like, the 20th yeah. wave, and I'll just be base game still, which is fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I guess the thing is with me is I'm not a huge Marvel person. So that wasn't going to keep me, you know, like wanting to keep it around. If It if mm. it, it just, for me, I was like, I think I'd rather play Eon's End, you know. Hmm. That was what I'm it thinking. was. I think it was a bit too similar for me, for those yeah. two. Because the way the Nemesis, the bosses work, sort of similar. I love yeah. hearing everyone talk about it though, because I'm like, oh, I know who that character is, and I know that boss, and that that move is really thematic. That sounds great. Like I yeah. do love all so that. You're about really it. into like, the yeah the comics. I think I just I'm into to the, the comics to a lot, and I, you know, I've been for decades, but I haven't played Marvel Champions yet. I did sit in on one of the games um, that was played last year or two years ago, not the retreat, and. Yeah, I kind of, I wasn't super excited, you know, to say, oh, I really want to play this. I, I want to try it at some point, but watching the game did not grab me much. Yeah. So I, I do like that you can turn I, your th thing over and lay low, you know, like you can. Yeah, be, that's yeah, cool. Yeah, alien. That's cool. I, I, like I did that. like, cool. I did like how, because I only played it with Connor and I loved how he like had the Iron Man and was building the Iron Man suit. That was mm. pretty cool because that was like, that makes sense. Like that really worked. Every that game worked is fun game. with Connor though, you know, like yeah. you can make Monopoly fun. Plus 10 to fun. Plus 10 shirt. to fun. Yeah, that's <laughs> funny stuff. Yeah. All right, <laughs> let's were, just, yeah. let's get this over and done with because like, one of these games is going out. <laughs> we'll just put it out of its misery. All right, so one of the games got 55 votes. This is a total shocker, by the way. I was I was shocked. And one game got 83. And that's Eclipse. Eclipse won 83. Wow. It's actually, it's that's so actually low. quite what? low for the votes. For like, both. <laughs> yeah, for both, especially Marvel yeah. Champions, a Marvel I game. Like, you'd think yeah. that would just get – I thought that that would win because it has a broader appeal. Yeah, that, I, I was the same. Me too. I didn't Very get my surprising. hopes up. I didn't get my hopes up, I thought, for sure. Yeah, well. There you right. go. Eclipse there is a great go. game. It deserves to go it on to the second round. I mm. totally agree. Okay, so this week we're going to be talking about... Oh, God. On Mars <laughs> versus Gaia Project. Def, go. God. Take this it away. This is going to be so hard. <laughs> Def, which I, one are you going to... I can't. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, one's number one, right? And one's not number one? It is, it's and so... I just had a, a massive sort of four-player game of, of on Mars a couple of days ago, and that was great. Yeah. But, um, again, I love my stats. I've played on Mars for a total of, I see here, 75 hours, which is still a lot, yeah. more than most of my games. But I've played Guy Project 160 hours, which is... Well. I don't even know how I got to that number. And the past couple of months, I've we've set up a little group with, which was set up by accident between me, Connor, and um, Harry. And we've been playing. We started playing Gaia Project every Monday to the point where we call them Gaia Mondays. And <laughs> it's just, yeah, I think uh, it's just a way to. I don't want to say perfect, but way too elegant of a design. Um, it has so much replayability. You could play it back to back to back and have completely different experience every time. I mean, I I think I, I don't know what else. Like I exhausted my creative thinking 
talking about this game in our top 10 last year. So if you want to hear I what I have to say, go back and, and watch that on, on our YouTube channel. Well, now, now that you've played it a lot more since we last spoke about it, is there like a top one faction or a top couple that you're like, they are my, if I get these, they're my go-to, I like them the most? No. And, or and even that's... just to enjoy, not necessarily out of a strategy, out of an enjoyment of play, is there one that you like, I like playing these because of this? I... I... I've enjoyed playing the Terrans because they are the one of the trickiest factions to play. They they basically go for the purple planets, which the other factions cannot colonize unless they get the guy former um, mm. spaceships or whatever. Which is too hard for most people. I haven't which even played too, enough yeah, that it's that yeah, it's exactly. easy enough for me to do. I'm like, oh, that's too hard. Do everything <laughs> else in the game. <laughs> but you know, they're, I they're like kinds those of stuff that you know th th those are the games that i've had that are really phenomenal or went really really bad which is usually a good sign for something of very variability and kind of like um what is carl carl van oster was saying with like the alchemists in merchants of the uh, merchants cove not Merchants of the dark cove merchants cove how the alchemist has a real swingy losing so it can really lose hard or it can really win hard is it do you mean it's a bit like that you've had games where you've just got obliterated but games where you've just dominated yeah but i mean usually yeah. i don't think this is like game it's more uh, this is what i love about this game it's more about the small changes that you make in your approach and your game and they have such big impact um throughout the game and they're only small changes. You know, you do one thing this way and another thing different way next time. And all of a sudden you have a completely different game in your hands because the game is so tight and the design is so elegant. Um, and this is this is why I love it so much. I mean, um, I absolutely love On Mars and I'd play it any time, even after midnight. Um, but it's it's very, very difficult to compete with Guy Project. Extremely difficult in, in my view. Am I right in saying here is on Mars in all of our top tens? Yeah. Yes. Just, yeah. So I mean, like, it's a phenomenal game. I yeah. think anyone that associates, anyone that knows Vital Lacerda, I think knows on Mars. I think that's his most like the game that he's most synonymous with. I think it's like yeah, it's got to be I, up I there with it's. Venice I mean, and... I think it's more. I think it's so. Lower. Yeah, I think it's even more than that. I think I think just on Mars is more heard of. I don't know why. I just think it is. Um, but you've but, played both a lot recently as yes, well. Yes, both. Adrian. Yeah, what a did, lot. What's your take on this? I I love Gaia Project. I think it's a phenomenal game. I think it's like number twelve or something on my top ten. Like, which one would you play right now? If I said, okay, let's play Gaia or on Mars, which one? Right now, go. Think quick. Just uh, say it. Just gotta I, say it. Can we just play both back to back? Yeah, like, oh, yeah. No, 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 not allowed. <laughs> um, man, I my biggest problem with Gaia Project is uh, I don't get to play it as much. That's the thing. MJ just doesn't enjoy it, so therefore, what I hey, don't play. Really? It. She thinks it's okay, but she would. If I said, "Do you want to play Gaia Project or on Mars?" She'd say, "On Mars, hands down." She loves okay. on Mars. It's one of her yeah. favorite games of all time. It's something that we played multiple, multiple, multiple times, know the game incredibly well. And I think that that's a little bit of the difference is that Gaia Project, <clears throat> to know it on the level that like Def knows it, you need to play 170 hours and you're still probably only halfway through. Whereas we have played on Mars, I don't know how many times, but you feel comfortable, like you have a pretty good idea of what you're trying to do. Whereas Gaia yeah. Project, I feel, does turn and change quite a lot depending on your faction, depending on what everyone else is doing and all that kind of stuff. Not that On Mars doesn't well, change. On Mars has happen. a lot of variability, but Guy Project yes. has all that variability. And then on top of that, you're a different faction every time, potentially. Yeah. yeah. And we have a, um, a, a joke with uh, Connor and Harry, because when we started doing these Guy Project Mondays, we um, uh, I was looking at Board Game Geek and reading stuff about um, the game randomly. And then... There were these people that have, you know, competitions and tournaments and stuff. And they were saying, they were talking about one specific faction, right? And they said, well, if you're a newbie to the game, like if you've played it less than 200 times, then blah, blah, blah. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. Less than 200, yeah. Um, yeah. But 
Sarah, you've played um, Guy Project's um, played it a few times. current game, um, <laughs> Terra Mystica. It's one of your favorite games, and you've played on Mars Heaps. Yeah. What What's your take on this sort of comparison? Oh, man. <laughs> I'm in the same boat as you guys. Um, it's really it's really tough because okay so on mars you i still play it with like i look at the variable setup and i think about okay what's going to be good to build like in terms of which buildings what's going to get lots of points and also the blueprints i always do something different you know like Mm. it may it may be the same it may not have like as it might not be as wacky as like Gaia Project is with a different faction, and you look at the the variable setup and you think, well, how's this how's this faction gonna gonna achieve those goals? Like mm. it, that's a really neat puzzle, it's awesome. But on Mars, ha- sort of has a really similar thing. Um, even still and heaps I, of yeah it, variability. It's still yeah. heaps of there's so the much missions, to there's so the much base, to, the base of the end of the game. You never know whether how that's gonna creep up on you exactly yes so okay so that's the probably the one thing uh is and this is this isn't even a bad thing either um but on mars can end abruptly like or more abruptly than you want i love that i love it too normally i'm on the front foot for that and then i go and we're your last turn mj and she's like what I, I need two more turns. I've got to do yeah. all this stuff. Why did you end it? I'm like, because I knew you needed two more turns. And that's why we're ending it right now. Yeah. So that I like that. That's fun. Yeah. I really like when players can control the end game. I do like that a lot. Mm. Um, but then in Gaia, you can just plan to get the most out of every round and just try and squeeze every round for all the points you can. And mm. that's also so good. So I think I'm like totally on the fence. I don't even – really know which one I would vote for. Okay. I have in to a say pinch, as well. Maybe on Mars in a pinch. I don't know. I have seen Dimmy do that a couple of times as well, Def. Like she will squeeze every last point out of each of those end round tiles. And it's like maybe it's two points or or three points or four points and I'm not getting any. And then by the end of the game Yeah that's when like, I get like a six thirty she's points got like, difference. Yeah like thirty points extra. Yeah. Because she's done all the little bits that have all added up. And I'm always like, man, that's only worth like three points. I'm not doing that. I don't care. But it all adds up. It really does. And that's cool, you know. So, yeah. You I, know the On Mars yeah. expansion's coming soon. Yeah. yeah, it's on the boat. It's on the way. Yep. It should be yeah. here um, very, very soon. So that's very exciting. Mm. Yeah. There is a um, Guy Project expansion that's been designed currently by Helge, uh, and I think that's still, you know, a minimum a year away or um, even even potentially more, but I, I don't mm. know what more you could ask of, of that game. So what do you think the community is going to vote? This is a really different bracket battle because none of us, we're all in the, fa- the fence. I feel like the community is going to go with... On Mars, on just, Mars? but not, not so. a lot. Not, I don't think it will be much. Yeah. Okay. It'll be real close. Is, I think it'll be close. Yeah. I mean, but... a, a people who play Gaia play a lot of Gaia. Like, look at you guys. You're playing it every Monday. I just seen Ian O'Toole post in the Facebook community that he's been playing. Seven, he said he's played sixty plus game or games. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so, like, that's that's someone that's played it a lot as well. I think people who play it love to keep playing it. So, yeah. Yes. I think it could be really close and really yeah. interesting. So, awesome battle though. Yeah, it and is a good one. one of them's going right? to be kicked out of the, ba- of the bracket, and I'm sad about that. Oh, well. <laughs> I wish they both got right. a pass. We've, we've had worse outcomes in our brackets before, so. Yeah. I'm just going to hang back. Go. I'm not going to vote for either until the last <laughs> minute, and then if they're really close, I'm going to even it out so they both tie and then they can both go through. Delete Special that board rules. game barbecue vote because someone votes under board game barbecue still. <laughs> it's uh, you, Adrian. No, it's I'm not. Sure. It's just definitely not me. <laughs> someone does it. It's Mitch, man. I'm telling you, he did it last time when he tried to. Was it him that was doing it last twindle time? Twindle your El Grande thought... vote, remember? Yeah, I and remember. And he tried that. to vote, and then he took his own Every vote Every time. Off. <laughs> I know. It was really rude. I didn't like that. I thought it was you because I thought you didn't know how to log out as no. board game barbecue. So I, <laughs> I don't know how to log out, but I don't vote. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, cool. let's move on to the oaths. Hi, everyone. Connor here. Just want to take a sec to talk about one of our sponsors, 2D6 Games up in Brisbane. 2D6 support this podcast, and Dan, Dave, and Joe are a great community-focused team who are always present at our game days. They offer free shipping Australia-wide, which is an incredible bonus. They also directly support the Brisbane Game Day. So if you ever had a Brisbane Game Day, drop into their store and say hello. Okay, so I just wanted to give a shout out to the community and all our wonderful Patreons. Um, thank you all for supporting us uh, all the time in all the different ways you support us. Thank you for Patreons for, um, you know, donating and also to the community members that help us, to volunteers that help us at events. You guys do so much for us. Uh, and also, if you're thinking of supporting us in a way um, – you want to help us out you can go to apple Podcasts, leave a star rating and review for us there because that really helps us with our algorithms and things like that i think spotify has a rating system now too. it does now yeah like a little five star or you could just do one star but i said five star <laughs> it has a little five star button press that five star button don't press the one star button. please don't press the one, <laughs> <laughs> press the one. <laughs> uh, you can also uh join the board game barbecue community if you haven't already by going to our facebook community page board game barbecue community on facebook you can follow us on twitter we're on instagram we're on youtube as well and there is our um, discord community if you want to see def having <laughs> meltdowns over rule books it's you can go Greek. there <laughs> <laughs> and all the links to all of these are in the show notes as well okay so swear an oath all right. Who wants to go first? I guess Def's like off the hook, right? So <laughs> he's shrugging. Unless can remember what I swore an oath four oh, months ago to do, that would well, be pretty hard. But yeah, well, we might get somebody from the community figure it out. By the way, I wanted to just say, take advantage of what you just said, so and say a massive thank you to, to the community because it, it's a place like, like no other and we have a lot of wonderful people in. When I departed the podcast back in January, I got overwhelmed with the amount of love and support um, the the community members um, showed me. So I thought I wanted to thank them um, today, coming back for that. Cool. Mm. I was going to clap. And then I thought, is that weird to do on a podcast? On your own, just yeah, clap just, on just clap on my own. I do it all the time. <laughs> Sounds like a sibling clap, then don't do it. <laughs> if Sarah claps on her own, does <laughs> no one hears her? Anyway, let's move on. Okay, so oaths, Adrian. Mine was go? to play Joddle, like because Joddle. <laughs> Is that what, what the cool kids Jottle? are calling it? Oh, Jaws of the Lion. Jaws of the Lion. Yeah, Joddle, Joddle kids. Jottle. Like, yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm down with the crew and mm -hmm. the Joddle massive. But like, uh, anyway, the, Jaws of the help. Lion, I have not got it to the table for a while because I've been playing Kingdom Death Monster and a couple other things, but we had our Jaws of the Lion group come around and we played like another scenario. We're now on scenario, awesome. I think, 13. Uh, we were like so like cocky because we're like, we'll have the whole day and we're going to like smash three scenarios. It's going to be amazing. And then like one of the scenarios that we were on was like, if anybody dies it's game over start again mm. and 30 minutes in i think i died and then we started no, again no. and i think an hour in someone else died and we had to start again and then we did it on the third run now, at least it wasn't you both times that would have been <laughs> that would have been embarrassing uh more than usual but like it's a great game man it's really good the card play is really fun like i forgot how fun the card play is in that comparative to say kingdom death where it's a lot of dice rolls like the card play in jaws of the lion is really still interesting and and um thinky like it's not just like oh, i'm gonna get behind the monster and stab him and roll two dice here we go it's really cool that you get to put these cards in a different order and that changes the player turn order and and how that all works i kind of forgot how really solid it was mm -hmm. and how much and we all came out of that day saying that was awesome like we should just organize it again for something sooner rather than too far apart try and smash and it, was, it out yeah and it was really good because once we played the first one and obviously got whooped like it was fun to just get straight back into it and just go again because we were better prepared 
because we hadn't played it for so long. And yeah, it's still a really great little game. Really love it. It'll, I mean, like it was what, like 70 bucks and you get all that content. It's crazy. I know. Um, it was like the best value game of yeah. last year. Was it last year it came out? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I, we, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thought it was great. Really looking forward to just keep, you know, plowing through that basically. Um, so yeah, Ove complete. Well done. There we go. Pat on the back. Pat on the Pat back. Pat on the back. Thanks, me. And then uh, <laughs> New Oath. Man, New Oath. Like, this is hard because, like, you kind of like, do I want to do this? Do I want to do that? Should I do this? What's actually achievable in reality? Uh, so I will do what I usually do and drag someone down with me. And I'll let Def decide because I... I actually really want to try one of those coin games, but I also Mm. really want to go back to my Norfolk roots and get back onto the 1862. Oh, God. (laughs) Because 1862 is actually set in my county. So that really interests me. And I know that Des played it recently and he's messaged me like a bunch of times saying, you will love this. I keep telling Dimmy, you will definitely love this. And I don't just necessarily think I'll love it because of the ties to where I was born. I actually really enjoyed Chesapeake and thought it was a great game. And it was one of the best gaming experiences I've ever had. So what are we doing? Are we playing a coin game or are we playing 1862? Um, I don't know. I, I think 1862 is is going to, as as. as crazy as it sounds fi- fi- easier to find people to play with yeah okay cool let's well, go with that we'll go to we're going to go to back to east angula that's where i'm from check it out on the maps google map that <laughs> we're going there we're <laughs> going to play 1862 just so. need to book an entire weekend for it yes we will have to start at probably 7 a.m and go on yeah. until whenever but i'm excited i, I loved my first 18 xx experience so i want to keep that and, and that's try awesome again, so yeah adrian i love that you started with like like the new baiting xx if that's even a thing and now you're going to like the hardcore one straight away <laughs> yes. yeah if i had to yeah. read the rule books i wouldn't be doing it because i would be yeah. screwed but luckily have, def knows that, how to do these things that's actually so. yeah you're onto something there because i played an 18 xx for the first time a little while ago and hmm. yeah i played with someone who you know, was very experienced and uh, basically did a lot of the, even just the accounting hmm. for us so we could just concentrate on, like, getting our head around all the different crazy stuff we could do, mm, mm, you know. Mm. So I think that that's a really good way, like, have a have someone at the table who's a veteran who can show yeah. you how it works. Yeah. And I really enjoyed the last one because right near the end of the game, I managed to sell some shares and dump shares. Yeah dumped the price of the shares which then enabled me to buy my own company and my own shares and start my own company up like right near the last round and get a diesel engine and all that and i really enjoyed that feel of like yeah being able to let things go let things go get something else like you don't have to hold on to you know like it it really it's not like the euro sensibility is to you know you this thing i bought is mine and i yeah I have to yeah. hold on to it the whole time. And 18XX are not like that at all. Yeah. Well, I only owned 30% of that thing. So I just like dump that 30% and buy myself a big, like, yeah. 70%. Did you leave someone else? Thing. Did you leave someone else with it? Like, I loved I, doing I that. Sold, I sold it and Dimmy owned it. And I think it, it dropped the thing down three spots that's right and yeah. she couldn't and sell the last the last share I don't, right? know how, I don't know how it worked at the end but all i was focused on was that my last thing was buying the last company and, and getting a diesel engine in that and just running it for the last couple of turns to try and make money for me not for someone else because yeah she had the majority share in that company so every time i was doing stuff i was just making her more money than than anything yeah. else so i was like i just dump those shares and the share price dropped and that would give her less money but then i could use that money to buy my own thing and yeah, it was really fun like i mean it was in, it was very interesting and something that i hadn't really experienced before apart from in city of big shoulders mm. and uh mini express which obviously is a lot a, lot, a little uh, a little lighter on the yeah. lighter side but yeah it was still great i loved it so 
Yeah, it was really fun when I played too. I remember I dumped some shares and then poor Carrie had one share left. She was the only one that had a share left, so she couldn't dump the last share because uh, someone has okay. to own it. Someone has to be the director. Yeah. And then I and then I bought a new company, like a flashbang company near the end as well, and no one else jumped on board. I don't think people oh. people didn't trust me, I guess. That's they didn't exactly think they're like be. you don't know what you're doing. So I'm yeah. not buying a share. And I was like, well, fine. And I ended up pulling off a sweet move and uh making loads of money. Yeah, that's exactly the same, right? That's what happened to me. Like yeah. I, I was like, good, dumped don't buy everything, these don't spent buy the yes, and I just I dumped loads of stuff. I was like, get rid of that. I got 10% in that, get rid of that. And I just bought as much as I could of this one company, which was my own, and then just yeah, just made as much money as I could at the last last hurdle. So I think I came second. So yeah, oh, it, was, nice it was a good yeah, good game. Really enjoyed it. So and I, I don't and that's another thing as well. Like I said it before on the pod. I don't mind playing a five hour game, six hour game if it's engrossing no. and engaging and it constantly is because yeah. that share market changes. You've got to watch the tracks, you've got to figure out what you're doing, you've got to keep an eye on other people's shares, what they own, what they don't own. So it was it really is an engrossing experience. So I, yeah, I loved it. So and it's um, you just don't notice that time; it just flies. Hundred percent. Don't yeah. notice it at all. The sixteen packets of digestive biscuits I noticed because I ate those. So that each time I was a wrapper, that was an hour gone. So I was just like, yeah, you know. <laughs> so, that's that's a pretty. That's a pretty big go. Eighteen sixty-two. That's one of the most complex, <laughs> biggest, longest games showing, we could. Well, it might take us eighteen hundred and sixty-two minutes to play it, right? Or hours? I don't know yeah, which. We'll see. But- I don't yeah. know if you guys have a local 18xx thing, but um, uh, they're not a sponsor, by the way, but um, Behold Games. So Tina from Behold Games is running like a 18xx oh, okay. like day in, in oh, Sydney. Nice. Yeah, so she invited me along. So I might go to that and see see what's up next time she runs Do it. it. So. Dump some shares. Dump some shares <laughs> by <laughs> company. There, like, dump some shares at you for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so I'm talking, so I'll, I'll go. Uh, so I have the the one on the, the back burner is also Jaws of the Lion, Adrian. I, have, um, I haven't played that yet. Still waiting for my son to come around. But we did play my other one, which was uh, Railroad Inc. We played that um, today, actually. And um, that was really good. We, we played it with a Pac-Man expansion. But because they can't say Pac-Man because that would be illegal, uh, they would get sued for that. It was called Pluckman. So we played with the Pluckman dice. <laughs> okay. Adrian, you're looking so confused. I bought that Railroad Inc. Uh, Kickstarter with all the like little tiny mini expansion things. Yeah, so nice. this, this was kind of cool because you had to, so you had to um, put, you, ha- you rolled the, the Pluckman dice and if you, it, it could be a ghost, a cherry or, or pa- I'm just going to say Pac-Man because Pluckman's silly. Um or Pac-Man, and then you've got to ride it on one of the exits that you haven't okay. used yet, and you've got to connect it up. And you've got to get Pac-Man with a cherry and ghosts all connected, and then you get three points for the Pac-Man and you get two points for each of the ghosts. But if you don't get a cherry, because you know the cherry powers you up so you can eat all the ghosts, yeah, right? Yeah, they, they eat you. That's right, or they eat you. So if you don't end up connecting the, a cherry, then – the um <laughs> then the ghosts are minus two points each because they hurt you so you can have like a negative you can have negative points in the thing so it's really cool it's like a, a really neat little expansion you can just add to it and yeah that's it it was super simple it was, awesome yeah so we're having fun with those and i think um i think Sully liked that one because of the pac-man thing yeah. And there's there's three more arcade dice. You can add like a rainbow dice that you can put different colored tracks. Like you color in tracks. I didn't have color Texas, so I was like, we're not doing that one. Let's do <laughs> let's do the Pac-Man one. <laughs> um yeah, so that was good. It was good fun. My next one. Um, I have kind of been inspired by Def to like play things more i just want to play the same game and more and more and more so i've been playing a game i was going to talk about it tonight but i think what i will do is i will actually put it as an oath to play a couple more times so i can talk about it in more depth i played it a few times now it's called the smoky valley which is a spielworks game Mm. it's quite heavy too so you know like i think uh it definitely deserves a lot more plays before i um I really talk about it, but it's pretty neat. I like it. It's very tight economy-wise in the game, 
and it has this really cool thing where you're you're trying to be made you're like you're a big wig in griffin town which is uh uh in canadia um <laughs> and you uh doing a lot of things you're like shipping goods and you know all the euroy things but it's pretty neat and you're trying to compete with people like in popularity so that you can be the mayor you want to be voted in as well and when you get voted in you get to decide what the what the town like um what the projects should be like in terms of oh uh we want to focus on you know health and th and things for the people so you might put that one as the top priority and th this is basically just for scoring because you'll have cards that that relate to those things and so if you're the mayor you get to dictate how much those cards are worth like as a multiplier mm. so there's quite a lot of competition for that mm. popularity so you while you're doing all these things to make money you also want to do good things for the town so that you'll be popular so that you might get voted in as a mayor because then you'll get lots of points. So it's pretty neat. Anyway, so I'm going to swear an oath to play that a few more times before I talk about it in depth on the podcast. I'm really into the Spielworks games lately, guys. I keep yeah, reading right. them. Uh, They're really different. I really like yeah. what um, well, I really like what they do. I want to play that one that sounds right yeah. up my alley. You'd like it. It's got this crazy high complexity rating on BGG that I don't think is really as it's not that realistic. I think it's four point three or something on BGG, which makes it sound like incredibly high. Yeah, I mean, I, th I feel like that will come down. I really do. It's not that complex, <sighs> you guys. <laughs> I don't know. After playing the the coin games, I mean, all bridges burning has a complexity of three point four, which is like. That less than plans of caledonia so this is like it it all depends on the audience of the people that play these games right yes that's right yeah. so that's like another you have to look at that as no this is four coin games only this that's right this rating yeah 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 so awesome. um so that's yeah smoky valley so i swear, sarah green swear to play it a bunch more times before the next time on the podcast yes adrian i know yeah I, got my hand up. Up. I have my hand up like i'm in school because i get in trouble for talking too much on this podcast <laughs> all the time behind the scenes they're cruel to me but just talking about school works games <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah they uh I, I played the cost Yes. I didn't really think about it before, but I, yeah. I need to play it again a couple of times to get my head around it. But it I sounded like you were all Care Bears. You were all too nice. Everyone was nice. Yeah, that's I'm happy with that because I didn't know exactly what I was doing because it's yeah. it's such a unique game and so unique in what you're doing yeah. and, and and the way the game actually plays that even though it's not like massively heavy, there's a lot to get around. Like. Yeah. Did you feel like did when the rules were explained and it was like your turn? Were you just like uh, someone tell me what to do? I did. I want, felt like, a bit like that. I did in inventions when we played inventions. <laughs> when Tali told us on the rules that I was like, I was messaging you like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I was like, great. Well, we'll be fine then. But like, it's, uh, I, I felt like yeah, I just didn't know really what to do uh, apart from like i took the matt riddle approach it's about asbestos mines you better mine some asbestos so i built a yeah. mine which really screwed me over because yeah. i couldn't i couldn't get it out of the mine to get refined to get it out of the country to get any money because we the the little the thing that boosts the, the economy resources. when you when you ship it out no when you ship it to a different country you know when right. you take it yeah, when you yeah, take it yeah. and you send it to the, the emerging market, market. Emerging market. Yeah. we didn't have any of those tokens that boosted its value. Mm -hmm. They were all they were all essentially the last actions to be taken from the game. Yeah. Therefore, the so emerging, it was still the emerging really market was really low. Yes, so it yeah. was really tight for money, and I felt that definitely when I started. I was like, "Wow, this is crazy." But I've, you know, it's like anything, like any of those kind of games. You play it once and then you learn and you go, right, well, next time I'm not going to do that because that was stupid. What I did was definitely an inadequate move to start the game. It's so. weird because, like, there's only four rounds in the game, right? And that first round, what are you going to make? You're going to make, you know, a couple of bucks. <laughs> I'm really? going to let someone else go first, then I'm going to put railways right where they are. Yeah. And then like, get try and get rail dominance early. yes and just make them go round and round in this like crazy <laughs> loop just <laughs> yeah Pac-Man. yeah you, that's the cool thing about the games you can do some crazy stuff yeah and um 
but but it's no it's kind of like in, in an 18xx no one tells you what you should do they're like well, just do whatever you want to do it almost yeah. like there's just not that many rails you could just do whatever and it kind of feels like that so you kind of have that oh i don't know what to do just tell yeah. me what to do i have someone. to give a shout as well to daniel who taught us the game like massive thanks he brought the game around came over taught the game and we played it and it was very enjoyable it's just one of those get like any of those kind of games you need to play it like three or four times to get a really good handle and grasp on it and especially this one because it is so unique it's not like anything else i've played yeah. So therefore, it's not like, oh, I just put a worker here and get these resources and do this thing. It's very different. So yeah, great game. So sorry, that was my spiel work spiel. Because spiel work about- spiel? Yeah. That's, that's yeah, but I think thing. they have a really good eye. Like I, I really like what they're putting out at the moment. Yeah. So I'm kind of on the on the bandwagon. I'm just ordering all of the spiel works games, you guys. <laughs> Somebody stop me. Um, so Def. What are you going to do? What's your, your uh, oath? Like, who knows what your old oath is? Who uh, knows? If, if somebody can remember for the community, please let, let me know. I, we I all know Draven knows. Draven's yeah, like James a knows. watcher right. from Marvel. He um, knows all. I'm going to do something pretty big given I've been away for, for so long. Um, I'm going to swear an oath to get some of you into coin games. I know Sarah has already put her hand up to play one of them along with Mitch. And I'm pretty sure, as I said, I can get another victim. I mean, another person to um, join us, Adrian. I'd like to play the Gandhi one. That really interests me. Mm. If that goes to four, I'd be really in for that. Yeah, they all they all um, go to four apart from All Burning Bridges, Bridges Burning, which yeah. is three. And Colonial Twilight, which is the only coin game that is a two-player game, which is about the, the French-Algerian uh, war. So they all go up to four. So that will be a big one, but that I'm sure that will take some time because I will have to learn the game that we want to play first, and then we're going to have to find a full day to play it. And that will be difficult with four people. So I want to do another one for the next episode and that's going to be to play more of perseverance which is the new mind clash game i've played it um, with timmy a couple of times i played it solo this morning and i want to play it a few more times before i talk about it on the podcast and yeah so that's going to be the the short term one and the long term one is um play a coin game with with a few of you and um adrian dragged me into a, an even bigger one play 1862 <laughs> yeah, so let, let's see how we fare with all of these yeah what let's, are we doing here yeah we should yeah. have just a bit full on I'm, I'm just gonna go back on holiday for three months <laughs> I, to say, I should have just said i'll show you guys fantasy realms okay cool we can knock that out in 20 minutes <laughs> but instead we've <laughs> we need to set aside an entire weekend for <laughs> instead for these all right. Um, thank you guys. Uh, again, like so excited that you're back there. It's been awesome. Um, thank you all thank for you. listening to the show and have an awesome week. Hope your next game is a sizzling one. Bye. Bye. Cheers. I don't know. I just looked up and ran a quick report right, for my stats. I love my stats. I have played 246 games since I was last on the podcast. <laughs> Whoa, you can just do the whole show.